Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I am replacing Chris Adam. He looks very similar to me. <laughs> uh, Chris and I have worked together for a long, long time, so I'm happy to do that, but it is his presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk about the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, so not South Africa, and, and not the, uh, and I'll, I'll tilt towards monetary policy very heavily, and therefore be talking about uh, independent currencies, countries with independent national currencies. So I don't mean the RAND monetary area or the CFA countries but all the other countries. Um, and so just, just quickly, uh, Chris starts out with a, a kind of tour starting in the mid-1980s of really uh, epical changes in how monetary policy is, is done in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he then goes on to talk about uh, a period now uh, starting, let's say, in the early to mid-1990s, a longish period now. Of, of reforms, favorable tailwinds, I'll say what he means by that, and then emergence of what a new consensus assignment, talking now about the relative responsibilities of monetary and fiscal policy, essentially. Um, and then it looks forward uh, to some contemporary challenges. Um, so just passing through here, wider is 1985, I guess. Here, that's Tanzania in the red GDP as a proportion of the U.S. GDP per capita, um, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa on average, Sub-Saharan Africa, I guess it must be, um, in, the, in the blue. So uh, Chris's story starts at the end of, uh, of a period already of very slow growth, um, and then the story we're going to tell about, uh, about internal reforms really starting in the late 1980s, and I think in spirit more or less concluded by about the mid-1990s, so that the direction of, of travel was absolutely clear in mo most of Africa by the mid-90s. Uh, and then you see the period, the longish period since then, of relative to the U.S. economy, uh, really much more favorable performance. I think the macro side has has something to do with that for sure, but I very much subscribe to the view of necessary but not sufficient condition, but clearly necessary. It was part of the syndrome of decline, uh, I think, uh, continent-wide through the 70s and 80s. So let me go first to uh, the 1980s and just remind you of, uh, of, the, of what macroeconomic policy looked like. Uh, a combination of exchange control regimes, so fixed exchange rate regimes dating from independence in the 60s, um, that had induced by the time of the oil shocks in the 70s and the tropical beverage shocks of the 70s, uh, had induced really tight rationing. In other words, the exchange rates were overvalued and you had increasing black markets and foreign exchange. Directed credit and interest rate controls, really classic financial repression throughout most of the continent. An oligopolistic banking sector, I say here, really mainly nationally owned dominant banks with a few other players in most cases. And then at the bottom, really, uh, fiscal dominance looming large. Um, and as Chris puts it, no effective nominal anchors in the system. So let me, let me back up. I'm going to put a little of my own framing on here just for a moment and th think for a minute about monetary policy and what its responsibilities are and think from a kind of conventional advanced country perspective. Nominal anchor of some sort would be job number one. Uh, regulate the financial sector would be job number two and no central bank can duck those two jobs in some form. Job number three might be macroeconomic stabilization. You might have an activist central bank with an actual monetary policy. Uh, and that's where you would, you would end there in describing a typical industrial country central bank. Now put that central bank into a development context. What would you sort of, what would you add? Well, the very first thing you would add is some role in financing the government. At least that would be your temptation. That would be your first thought. And so much of the story in sub-Saharan Africa from the point of, of establishment of the central banks out through the, the late 1980s 
was the dominance of that role of these central banks being played through the system, compromising their other functions in various ways. So that's why he says no effective nominal or fiscal anchors. The, the central banks being thrust in the, into the position of financing the government. Uh, but just for a moment, what else would you then add on your short list if you were taking a development view of the central bank? Um, financial development, developing the financial system as a key growth contribution of this institution would be on your short list. That also got compromised by giving these central banks heavy, heavy fiscal roles, both direct roles in financing the government and then indirect what are really quasi-fiscal roles, right? That as soon as you start to ration foreign exchange, you have become a fiscal authority because you're handing out subsidies across the economy. Uh, as soon as you start to direct credit, you are a fiscal actor. You are handing out uh, subsidies across the system. Um, uh, Joe Stiglitz added the, the last uh, development role, which is really on the short list of central banks in sub-Saharan Africa as a, as a question mark, which is promoting exports. And I'll stop there. Those are the three things I would say that when you take a central bank and situate them in a low-income country, you, you'd like to add. You'd like to, couldn't you just use this institution to help finance the government? Um, could, couldn't you use them to help to help advance financial development, and couldn't you use them to help promote exports? I'm going to come back to the exports question. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, a period that began in about the mid '80s and was the uh, was fully integrated with structural adjustment reforms in the real economy, were a set of reforms right in the domains of of central banks, and then. Uh, towards the end of the structural adjustment era, which I'm thinking of as being concluded in practical terms around the mid-90s in much of sub-Saharan Africa, towards the end of that period, it involved a definitive uh, attack on the relative roles of the fiscal and monetary authorities. So I I'm not going to maybe, well, I'll just dash, dash through. Uh, the reforms that were really key were first a dismantling of financial repression, so a liberalization of the banking sector, introduction of competition, uh, removal of interest rate controls, late 80s, early 90s, um, and, uh, and then, um, so that's exchange rate, and uni exchange rate unification, so dismantling of, ex of exchange controls, and, and uh, then in the, by the early 1990s, uh, this attack on inflation, which fundamentally was a, uh, was a closing of fiscal deficits under IMF conditionality. So this was a period where I think there was actually quite a favorable fit between the IMF's sort of uh, instinctive mindset at that period and the problem as it existed in much of Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, macro management. You needed to get the public sector deficit down to a level that could be financed at some reasonable rate of inflation without creating distortions all throughout the system. And that got done. There's only a couple ways you can do that when you've got high-ish inflation. Uh, and since fixed exchange rates were part of the problem, the solution was going to be money-based stabilizations that shut down go uh, financing of the government and let the exchange rate go. So we are now in the working out of that, of that era. In many, many countries, there was a serious and very searing period of fiscal consolidation, and then a movement on to floating exchange rates within the background, uh, this financial liberalization going on. Uh, the, uh, Chris talks about the, the, the emergence in the background of these events in Sub-Saharan Africa of a new con intellectual consensus uh, about how macro policy ought to be done and the role of central, ba central banks. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to probably not have time maybe to, to, to go through all these things. Let me just show you a, a, few, a few pictures to establish these points. So there's 1995, right in the middle there. And you see the movement away in sub-Saharan Africa, away from exchange rate anchors, fixed exchange rates, toward money-based regimes. Um, and then the emergence starting in 
with South Africa's adoption of inflation targeting of a few cases of formal inflation targeting or very close to it uh, regimes. I talked about fiscal dominance and the end of fiscal dominance as being a, really the driving reality. And the purple there is Nigeria, which tells the story the most dramatically. But if you look at the, uh, at the other bars, you see fiscal deficits as a percentage of GDP really going down definitively starting in the second half of the 90s. Okay, and that, that period is, is still with us and right now is coming under uh, tremendous pressure because of the fall of global commodity prices in many of these countries. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then I won't show you the picture, but uh, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, significant liberalization of the financial of of the capital account, very kind of Washington consensus kind of uh, uh, kind of movement, which which I think also probably push these countries more towards the uh, floating exchange rates. Uh, um, that had happened by, uh, during the 1990s. So not complete liberalization, except in some cases, but substantial. Um, let me show you a picture th that I like. I've added to this one in. Uh, it's a weird looking picture. But the bottom line is there was a massive convergence in actual con conduct of monetary policy throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is illustrated for the East African community here. Um, what I've done is I've taken this price level of each country and just divided it by the Kenyan price level and indexed that thing, uh, the log of that to zero, and then just seen what those ratios did over three decades, the 1980s, and then I rebased it again, the 1990s, and I rebased them again, and, the, and uh, starting in 2000. And so, you know, you just see Uganda going off into the stratosphere in, during the, the 1980s, and Rwanda and Burundi uh, actually having their prices uh, rise less rapidly than Kenya's, this massive spread, and you th see things converging already in the 1990s. And now, you know, why are we talking about East African Monetary Union? Well, the bottom line is that the divergences in how, in the conduct of monetary policy are really tiny now. In the, in the community, so this is this is really a, a major uh, a major backstory that you see throughout the continent. Uh, so, uh, what is this new consensus? Key to it: a clear re assignment of responsibility between fiscal and monetary policies, decline in fiscal dominance, a greater commitment to exchange rate flexibility, to avoiding uh, uh, severe real exchange rate misalignments rather than exchange controls. Um, and, uh, and then more recently, I talked about money-based stabilizations. Uh, more recently, a move away from the IMF reserve money programming framework uh, towards a really conventional operation of monetary policy through a, a short-term policy interest rate. So that move is underway in, in uh, Uganda, Kenya, other places. Um, and allied to it is an increase in the transparency of central banks in, the, in communicating their frameworks to the public. Uh, um, let me show you, that, show you that picture to give you a sense of it. So in the red here, African cases, this is a, looking at the uh, index of transparency uh, in 1998. So going to the right higher levels of transparency, you have the industrial countries up up there towards the right corner. And then the index in 2010, the blue line is a 45 degree line. So there has been general movement uh, in increased transparency reflecting the intellectual consensus uh, in, the, in, 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 uh, in the literature and in practice. And these, the African cases are very much on that, uh, that overall trend. So major, major changes, really. Uh, Let's go to looking at uh, let's go to looking at contemporary uh, challenges. So we're going through a period now, starting in about two thousand and nine, uh, of of falling commodity prices affecting many of of these countries and having a, a first order fiscal impact and an impact on the balance of payments. Therefore, pressures on the exchange rate. The key issue here, I think, it was articulated. Uh, by the earlier speaker, 
Uh, you've got a flexible exchange rate. The classic efficient macroeconomic response to a negative terms of trade shock is to allow the exchange rate to depreciate. Um, and that is happening, no question, big time. At the same time, the central banks have chosen an inflation anchor uh, rather than an exchange rate anchor. Uh, but this exchange rate depreciation, if, 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 if this uh, adjustment is going to occur through nominal depreciation, it is going to feed right into your headline inflation and going to face the central bank with a real question, do I push back against inflation? Do I allow the depreciation to take place? But do I tighten policy so that it takes place through dampening domestic wages and prices rather than through letting the exchange rate go through the roof? And central banks are facing that, that issue right now, and they're responding in a whole variety of ways, including reaching for some of the old instruments, capital controls, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of foreign exchange intervention. Um, and the question of whether these uh, uh, strategies are going to be sustainable, whether in a context of having opened the capital account, as you defend the exchange rate for a while and spend some reserves down in Nigeria, for example, uh, whether you get into a very dangerous spot where capital movements are now going to leverage up what's happening in the commodity markets. Uh, so we are coming into a, a very, very much uh, tougher and new environment. Um, mounting fiscal pressures I've talked about, but let's talk for just a minute about the debt dynamics because part of the, the favorable tailwinds during the 90s were debt relief uh, that really cleared the decks in terms of uh, public sector's finances uh, well in time for the global financial crisis, which had a knock-on effect in these countries, not so much through financial markets, but directly on their exports and, and revenues. Uh, and so countries were in a position to take a fairly activist fiscal response during the financial crisis, and the IMF uh, accommodated that largely. At the same time, they had developed their domestic bond markets starting in the early 90s, and they exploited those. So countries, uh, and at the same time, remember, during the huge run-up in oil prices following the Gulf War in 2003, there was tremendous prospecting in the energy sector throughout the continent, and a lot of countries found major uh, exploitable deposits and started to get the foreign direct inflows to, to, uh, to, um, to exploit those. All this stuff is happening uh, during the uh, 2000s and uh, very favorably, um, very, very favorably essentially putting these, these countries into the position where they can rebuild some, some debt with some long run objectives in mind of developing the energy sector with some short-run objectives in mind of propping up the economy during the global financial crisis. But now, that nice starting point that they had going into the financial crisis has been eroded by this buildup of debts. And now the external, the sort of exogenous dynamics of debt have turned in a decisively uh, against, uh, against commodity exporters. Okay, so real interest rates are starting to rise. The sovereign spreads are, are, are rising. They're around, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, even maybe for Ghana's issue coming up. Uh, big, big interest rates on sovereign borrowing, and domestic bond rates are also rising. And at the same time, the growth rates because of the commodity shock are declining. So that, so that we really are in a classic uh, test phase of this of this package. Um, exchange rate concerns, uh, previous speaker talked about Helen Ray and uh, the ca capital account, the problems of uh, monetary policy under an open capital account. Uh, I think there's still uh, enough lack of integration, uh, in, especially in, among the lower income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, that even with an open capital account, there's scope for the central bank to uh, pursue domestic targets like the inflation rate uh, at the same time as keeping an eye on the exchange rate. But that is always a matter of degree, and we are now coming into a situation, I think, where, uh, where the limits on that uh, maybe start to become apparent. 
I'm, I think I'll, I'll not talk so much about, uh, about macro models. Let me talk, let me finish uh, by going back to the Stiglitz point, okay? Because I think this is a really, really important issue. So Joe sort of suggested that central banks ought to be like China. They ought to have a mercantilist role. Uh, that is to say, they ought to peg a weak exchange rate as a way of subsidizing exporting activity and import substituting activity uh, when you lack, when you either lack the fiscal instruments to do it or you're under WTO rules and you have the instruments but you can't use them. So let's, let's run a weak exchange rate. And I think that, you know, uh, you can't just say let's have a weak exchange rate and get that done, okay? So somehow you have got to be like China. China's saving rate was 60%, okay? So they could run a weak real exchange rate by not spending anything and just piling up every year a balance of payments surplus that was the counterpart to this weak exchange rate. That's why I say mercantilist. Uh, and, I, you know, I w Joe's not in the audience, but I would have asked him the question, you know, uh, what form of austerity do you suggest, that would be a little impish, what form of austerity do you suggest that we impose on the African consumer uh, in order to run a weak exchange rate over more than the next six months? We can do it for six months. If it's a temporary shock, no problem. We do that all the time. But a, but a secular weak currency strategy, look, uh, one of the key things we learned from the whole fight, okay, was that uh, central banks have limited capability to do fiscal things. And so that's, there's a real danger here of slipping the central bank back into a role that is a fiscal role. If you want to subsidize exports, get rid of the constraints on exporting, work on that business environment, find ways to get around the, the WTO subsidies, uh, don't allow a transitional real appreciation when you can avoid it. But running a, a chronically weak exchange rate, boy, that's, that's a tough one. Maybe someone in the audience can figure out how. Thanks very much.